In the opening, we see Hermes, who is an ancient sage, but here depicted in his solely divine form, his pre-incarnate form, where he is revealing, inscribing, and bearing this story of creation near what will become a shrine of Osiris in a secret location. And according to the story, God is depicted as a good father and creator of the cosmos. Tobias focused on topics, mysticism and mystical theology, focused on divine ineffability. And these souls are all assigned the region above the stars to control the stars. And this is important because it shows that in their origin, stars or astral bodies are inferior to our human souls. Since stars, although made of fire primarily, also contain elements which the Greeks thought of as earth and water. Souls were charged with the creation of animals. And in creating animals, they followed the model of the zodiac. That is, the zodiac is literally the, the starry animals. As the story goes, souls were punished by being disorderly and leaving their station. Beyond what we all study, because we're talking about a tradition that would be so ancient, it would go back to, these Indo-European traditions go back prior to the invention of agriculture. Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. But if you want to go higher than the Gnosis and attain apotheosis, you should join this course. And I am not kidding right now. This course, I've been going back to it, you know, as like a, you know, as my own personal notes and my own personal like information center to get ideas for videos. And this is seven courses on the ancient mysteries. You got Attis, you got the Samothracian mysteries, you got Osiris, you got the Christianity mysteries. Because the Christianity, is it a mystery cult? Is it not? We get into that in the course. Dr. Litwa here is brilliant in this course. You, 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 have, you have this entire section of notes. It tells you how far along you are as far as percentage-wise in the course. And you're going to learn a lot from that, and you're going to be at a level of like master's degree level stuff like this is this is graduate level information that he's giving away for one percent of what it costs to go to college so i just want to throw that out there the course the link's in the description you're not gonna you're not gonna regret it also if you want to check something else out too he has a youtube channel that's free you can just subscribe to that and get tons of content related to my channel and uh from an actual academic who is a professor. And the last but not least, he has a Patreon. If you want to support him for the work he's doing and also get access to content that's locked that no one else can see, check out the Patreon. All three of those links are in the description. And we're going about to get into a topic today that is so fascinating. Dr. Litwa, thank you for coming back on. Thanks, Neil. Yeah, today I want to help people become better adepts at the great and wild and mysterious world of the Hermetica. There's a group of the Hermetic writings that pretty much everyone who's watched a YouTube video knows about, and that is the Corpus Hermeticum. And these are 17 treatises organized by Byzantine scholars, which survive and were transmitted during the Renaissance. But what is often passed over in the Hermetic literature is what is called the Stobaean Hermer Hermetica. That is the Hermetica uniquely transmitted by a roughly fifth century excerptor called John Stobaeus. And in this set of excerpts, he gave us something which we never had before and which we have absolutely nowhere else. And that is the great treatise of Isis to her son Horus called the Kori Cosmo, 
or the pupil of the cosmos. And today I just want to get people introduced to this text because it is a fantastic creation story with plenty of authentic Egyptian and Greco-Egyptian ideas that is generated right when Christianity is in its infancy. But the Egyptian writer is so proud of his own native Egyptian traditions, he does not even think to mention Christian or Christianity. So let's say a little bit about John Stobaeus. John Stobaeus lived and worked in a place called Stobi of Macedonia, probably in the 400s. And he's writing a book that is simply a book of excerpts, like you might go into a books, bookstore today and find simply a book of quotes. This is what John was, was writing. And he chose from all of Greek literature, which was available to him, hundreds of books which are no longer available to us. And that is why this book of excerpts is so important. John wrote it for the education of his son. And books one and two are traditionally called the excerpts. And in Greek, these are edited by Kurt Voxmuth. And books three and four are traditionally called the Florilegium. And these are edited by Otto Henza. So you'll see in the Greek editions, Voxmuth and Henza. And I have heard through the grapevine that very soon in the next couple of years, we will have our very first full English translation of John of Stobaeus's work. But to get access to his Hermetica, you can check out my book called Hermetica 2, in which the first part translates everything we have from John Stobaeus on the Hermetica and gives you a much fuller introduction to Stobaeus. Basically, Stobaeus excerpted 29 passages from Hermetic writings known to him. A few of these passages overlap with what we know in the Corpus Hermeticum in Byzantium, but most do not. Most are unique, and that is they present new Hermetic information that we know is earlier, at least as early as the 400s, and Stobaeus focused on topics, if you're into, you know, mysticism and, and mystical theology, um, he focused on divine ineffability, things like the nature and destiny of the soul, the unreality of earthly phenomena, the rule of fate and the higher emotions, and a particular favorite of many, the stars and their energies. So if you're interested in any of these topics, definitely go check out the Hermetica II volume published by Cambridge University Press. I'm told there, were very, there will very soon be a, a paperback edition of this book. But today, uh, I'd like to focus on a very specific set of excerpts from a discourse, possibly a set of discourses, of Isis to her son, Horus, and this is can be found in the Stobaean Hermetica, that is SH, tractates 23 to 27. And I think all of these excerpts collectively were called the Kori Cosmo. Now, the Kori Cosmo, you can translate it as the, the girl of the cosmos, or translate it as the pupil of the cosmos, or the pupil of the world. I think it probably refers to Isis who is called the pupil of her father, and that is the apple of his eye. But there is some controversy over what exactly the phrase means, but it is a beautiful one, Kori Cosmo. And what's interesting about the story in the Kori Cosmo is it's all about reincarnation. So if you're interested in this topic, sometimes called transmigration, this is definitely something to read because although it's mostly associated with Hindu cosmology, this is part of the Western tradition. It goes back far into antiquity, back to Pythagoras, 
and it was thought that Pythagoras got it from Egypt. So the Egyptians of late antiquity considered reincarnation and transmigration to be their own native theory of how the world worked and how souls were chastised, improved, and made into good people. Basically, as many of you know, reincarnation means that our souls are our permanent selves, and these can enter into different bodies, including astral and animal bodies after death. And as I said, the Egyptians were widely credited with devising this theory. And when Pythagoras went to Egypt, he learned this theory and adopted it for the Greeks. We're not sure why the Greeks thought the Egyptians invented this theory, but perhaps it had something to do with the animal cults and the idea that souls or divine souls inhabited animals such as the ibis and the apis bull. But frankly, we don't know why the Greeks attributed reincarnation to the Egyptians. But as I said, the Egyptians, by the time we get to Christianity, gladly accepted this theory as their own native tradition. And in the Stabaean Hermetica 23, there is this wonderful story of creation, which I wish I could read to you, but you can read it for yourself in Hermetica 2. I'll just summarize it here. In the opening, we see Hermes, who is an ancient sage, but here depicted in his solely divine form, his pre-incarnate form where he is revealing, inscribing, and bearing this story of creation near what will become a shrine of Osiris in a secret location. And according to the story, God is depicted as a good father and creator of the cosmos. So we're very far from the evil creator and Gnostic systems here. Hermetic thought is, is not safely called a Gnosticism, although, of course, they thought that they gave gnosis, which just means knowledge or spiritual insight. At any rate, God is said to make the human soul by mixing his own breath with the purest type of fire, as well as other unknown elements. But what makes the human soul is that God pronounces magical, sacred, and secret formulas over the concoction, as if bending over a glowing cauldron. And it's these secret formulas that unite the souls together and create them as full of light and indestructible. And this soul substance, not yet distinguished into souls, is called the animatrix which is my translation of the Greek psychosis. And if we just transliterate it as psychosis, that sounds bad. So I've translated it as animatrix. It is the womb of souls. Now, what happens next is that the animatrix is split into a myriad of souls into specifically 60 grades of purity you're familiar with buying grade A milk. I've never seen them sell grade B or grade C milk, but this is the basic idea that souls are of a different degree of purity from the beginning. And these souls are all assigned the region above the stars to control the stars. And this is important because it shows that in their origin, stars or astral bodies are inferior to our human souls since stars although made of fire primarily also contain elements which the greeks thought of as earth and water souls were charged with the creation of animals and in creating animals they followed the model of the zodiac that is the zodiac is literally the the starry animals, and by looking at these animals in the sky, humans made animals on Earth. But as the story goes, souls were punished.
by being disorderly and leaving their station. And the punishment of souls is not an eternal an eternity of, of hellfire. God isn't a cruel, uh, vicious kind of a being. The the punishment or rather chastisement of souls is simply being put into coarser, thicker, and more sluggish bodies. That is the stuff you're inhabiting right now. And it's Hermes who makes the human body from a watered down and degraded animatrix. So the animatrix, our body is made out of the same substance as our soul is, but our soul is just at a very higher degree of purity and isn't waterlogged. The system of transmigration is nothing more and nothing less than a method of training the souls as it goes through the gymnasium of the cosmos. And if we learn our lessons in a single life, we will never need embodiment again. But like most of us, I think we're going to require multiple trial attempts. And that's what transmigration is for. There is no hell. The way that we improve is by being re-embodied. Souls who need more training, who are very vicious souls, like the souls of dictators, murderers, these pass into animals. And in animal form, they have rougher, shorter, and more brutish lives, which, again, the point of all this is not so that they degrade into nothing, but that they improve. And by improving is meant they fulfill their function. Superior souls then ascend through transformations into higher and higher bodies. And eventually, the goal is to return to a body that can surf the stars. But when souls are initially embodied, they go berserk. And because they're not used to embodiment and they wane and complain, why they whine, I should say, complain and yell. And to tame the soul's fate, which is simply the combination of astral energies, is introduced to control human bodies. But the Hermetic author is clear that fate only controls the human body. It is no power of the human soul, since, as we've learned, souls are higher than stars. Isis and Osiris come into the world. They are souls not in need of embodiment, but they were sent down in ancient times into the world, into the land of Egypt, to introduce the first elements of civilization and religious knowledge to humankind. And it's from their religious and spiritual teaching that all religions and all cults and all culture formed. And from the Egyptian point of view, Egypt is the first civilization and the mother of all civilizations. So what we learn, I think, from this creation story is something different than we would learn, say, from the Enuma Elish or the book of Genesis. It is that the nature of soul is something wonderful, wondrously composed of divine breath. Interestingly, in Genesis 2, it is also assumed that the soul is made from divine breath but it's simply not as emphasized as we find in this hermetic text. So it would be very difficult to think of a direct dependence, but I mean, there's no reason why the hermetic author wouldn't be familiar with Genesis 2. But for the hermetic author, the soul is a unique energy in the cosmos. It's distinct. We are good and our good is treasured up within us because we are the breaths of, of God, basically. And we are in training to take back our original function. That is to control the cosmos, to be higher than the stars and be in a kind of body which is not subject to death, disease, fear, and perishing. 
And I'll just say that the implications of hermetic thought are very important for Western culture because all beings have souls. And so this has, you know, this grounds our, our ethics toward animals as well. And souls, of course, can be transferred from body to body. So all living creatures deserve respect and have rights. Souls are neither male nor female. And the kind of life energy that is in humans is the same that is in all animals. So the point of life is very much like we see in with karma in Eastern religions, that virtues are rewarded with freedom from our heavy moral bodies and redeemed humans return to astral bodies by exiting this envelope and entering into another. So I think uh, I'll just close by giving you this final quote from the Kori Kosmu in which God is said to pronounce, quote, not at random or by chance have I lawfully determined your transformation, speaking to the souls. If you practice what is shameful, you will be transformed into something worse. Likewise, if you resolve to do something worthy of your origin, you will rise to a better state, unquote. And I think, you know, this gives you a taste for the beauty of the language of the Kori Kosmu, which is not always present in the other hermetic treatises. And that's why I want to bring this and other hermetic treatises in the Stobaean Hermetica to everyone's attention in hopes that you will seek out this wisdom embodied in these texts. And I will stop talking at this point um, and let um, Neil ask or anything or clarify anything he, he wants. Wow, that's very fascinating. Now, my first question on this is... Neil, I'm not hearing you. Oh, Are you... Am, I, am I muted? No? Yep. Do you hear me? Now, now you're good. Oh, okay. All right. So when I was, when I was wondering, when I'm listening to, I'm wondering how, because this is very similar to the Vedic theology, the Vedic cosmology. And I wonder, yep. I wonder if there's a, why that would be. And is there, do you think there may be a common ancestor between the two? going back or is this like way beyond, beyond your way you study <laughs> well i think in a sense it's beyond what we all study because we're talking about a tradition that would be so ancient it would go back to yeah indo-european traditions um and we can definitely have a you know a, a diffusion theory but these indo-european traditions go back as far as I know, you know, prior to the invention of agriculture, which is, you know, more than 10,000 years ago. And basically, we just have little memory of, of what was going on at that time and who was where. Right. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it is true that, that you know, because these are very, these are very Greeks. specific ideas. They're not like, like you, you, some of these ideas you might think could be a coincidence because you know, people might just have the idea of reincarnation just because they're wondering what happens after we're gone. But some of this stuff is very specific. It seems like it seems like there might there might be something connection happening. But then you all, but then that also raises the question: Why were why aren't the Sumerian? Unless maybe Sumerians do have a similar theology, but the Sumerians seem to have a completely different set system than all this. You know. Yeah, it's very common to have a, an underworld, um, and that's just not the case for hermetic thinkers um, in the sense that, or an, an underworldly punishment um, for hmm. hermetic thinkers. They just don't, they don't buy that, which is, which is interesting because in, in native in Egyptian mythology, there was something like an, uh, there, well, there was an underworld in which Osiris reigned. So you know, things are changing. You know, this is this is late antique Egyptian doctrine. This isn't earliest Egyptian doctrine. And of course, we should always keep in mind that, you know, this is Alexandria and in Egypt more broadly. And, you know, Indian traders were in and out of Alexandria on a regular basis. That's a real so point. that's a good point. Um, yeah, in a sense, we don't really need to probably look too far back. 
yeah. um, in the in the cultural melting pot of Alexandria, we've got a lot of what um, goes into the re the recipe, as it were. Yeah, and with with Horace, where what is Horace? What is his role as far as what what does he take? What's his? I don't know. How do I say this? What's his like duty basically? What is he doing? Why is he so important? His his birth and all that. What what's going on with Horus? Well, Horus is the the next great Egyptian divine king after Osiris. There's no Seth. Um, Seth apparently doesn't exist in this mythology. <laughs> and all that we all that we know about Horus is that. Isis, his mother, is is teaching Horus about primeval times. So in the Cory Cosmo, Horus is is the dialogue partner and is the one asking questions of Isis, his mother, trying to get information about what what has happened in the about you know the human soul and creation and the first civilization. Right. <clears throat> Last thing I want to ask you about is the Cory the Cory thing. Is this are they connecting the Isis to the Illusionian mysteries in a way? Well, Cori is just a, a common word, common Greek word for young girl. Um, okay. And so, yeah, many goddesses in the ancient world looked like Cori or or young young girls, right at kind of getting into the age of puberty, and you know, it's when that first kind of beauty emerges on the face and the girl becomes a, a young woman. Um, and yeah, so Isis and Persephone, they had been mixed and amalgamated for several decades by this, or I should say several centuries by this time. So it's not a mix of the Eleusinian mysteries, but, but it, it, it could be a, a mix of the deities assumed here. Yeah, and I noticed that you have you have a divine child, you have a divine maiden, and you have a, a father, Osiris. So I wonder if that's just a common trope throughout these mythologies to have something like that. Uh, I wouldn't say so. I mean, in Eleusis, the the father figure, Hades, is quite absent and a minor character. Um, yeah, I think ultimately I'm convinced that the local mythologies, when you really look at them in, in terms of their local variants, they're all significantly different. And we start to see similarities when we start like abstracting out things right. and telling like a very basic sort of story. But what I would encourage everyone, you know, and engaging in the Hermetic here too, is that go deep into this story and yes, you'll see similarities with, with the Bible, but you'll also see differences. And that's the same thing when you're dealing with all kinds of mythologies, but you've got to treat them all in their glorious detail. Sure. And this is a great way to do it. Well, this has been great. And I just want to, before we end, I just want to make sure everyone knows that this course is available right now. And I have a link in the description and there's more on this particular, um, religion the hermetica religion we have a poem Mandres, um i think it's number five and there's there's more to be learned on this subject as well as as well as the addis mysteries the orphic dionysus dionysus mysteries samothracian illusionian and and more in christianity so check out that check out the course i'm telling you everybody in the comments if you have the course let them know how good it is seriously let them know and if you just want something for free, go to subscribe to M. David Litwa's YouTube channel. That link is also in the description. And he also has a Patreon, so support him. And thank you for your time. Thanks, Neil. And thanks, everybody. Really appreciate your time and everything else. Take care. And you have just attained true gnosis. So Egypt looked very central to someone in Egypt. And native Egyptians boasted that they had the most temperate climate. And in this particular tractate, the author imagines, as it were, a human being situated upside down. And the heart of this human being lies over 
Egypt. If you just enjoy what you just watched, it's we're not done yet. There's another part to this. Part two is on the way right now. But to, to watch it, you have to go to patreon.com slash mdavidlitwa. And there is you can see the part two for exactly what you just saw. So I'll see you over there. You have just attained true gnosis. The Demiurge has no power over you.